Hey there, you are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling and this is the show that I produce in Sydney, Australia, where I speak to leading guitarists and guitar figures from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining me for episode number 128. Now today we have a special episode. I was approached by my friend Stevie Taylor, the producer of the excellent Gig Life podcast, who asked if I might like to co-host a guitarist round table and I said yes sounded like a great idea and we put together a fantastic panel of five of Australia's best guitar players Peter Northcote, Chris Kemzalos, Daniel March, Mark Maloof and Ben Rogers all brilliant players in many different spheres of guitar playing and we had a blast we we got together at Mark's studio and taught guitars for the better part of four hours so uh stevie edited the conversation down into two episodes today you're going to hear episode number one or part one i should say and really my my sincere thanks to stevie he was the uh the brains and the muscle of this whole thing put together uh the lineup um got in contact with everyone really made it happen did the editing and uh, i pretty much just rocked up and taught guitar which (laughs) which is what I like to do anyway. So uh, full credit to Stevie. This show originally um, was aired on the Gig Life podcast and uh, very kindly I am sharing it here on the Guitar Speak podcast. Please check out the Gig Life podcast. There are links to that in the show notes. I'm going to hand over to Stevie now who's going to run us through the intros and we'll jump straight into this guitarist roundtable. Oh yeah, before we start, there is a language warning on this episode. You might hear some words you've never heard before on the podcast, so please be advised. Over to you, Stevie. Hey, welcome to the latest installment of the Gig Life Podcast Roundtable Series. I'm your host, Stevie Taylor. Now, previously, we've done roundtable episodes for drums and bass. Today, it's the guitarist's turn. I feel extremely honoured to be joined by six pretty special Australian guitarists, cats that are making things happen. Peter Northcote, Chris Camzellis, Mark Maloof, Ben Rogers, Daniel March, who joined us via FaceTime, and Matt Wakeling from the Guitar Speak podcast. All these guys are multifaceted, prolific, proactive in their careers. Mark, Daniel, and Ben have previously been guests on the Gigaloft podcast, and both Peter and Chris have been guests on Matt's Guitar Speak podcast. For more info on all these guys and links to their previous podcast episodes, check out the show notes. If you're a guitarist and you haven't heard of the Guitar Speak podcast, well, You've got some 120 plus episodes on all things guitar to catch up on. Interviews, product reviews, gig reviews, it's all there. Go check it out. Matt is doing great things for the guitar community in Australia and abroad. Now, not being a guitarist myself, I felt a little bit out of my comfort zone with this guitar roundtable. So I asked Matt if he would join us and help me out. So thank you, bro. Bloody legend. Guitar Speak Podcast. Look it up. Subscribe. And download. I also want to give a big thanks to Mark Maloof. When I was looking for a place to host this podcast, um, Mark put his hand up and offered his creative space for us to hang. This podcast was recorded at Mark's personal production suite at Everland Studios in Sydney. Mark is also a pretty schmick baker and a wine enthusiast, so he also provided some uh, mean sourdough and some sweet wine. So thank you, man. The recording ended up going for about about four hours. Um, I know that's a long time to sit down and listen in one hit, so we've broken it up. So this is part one of two. In part one here, the guys discussed a range of topics from music that is currently inspiring, developing their styles, building their business, 
how they approach playing with a second or third guitarist or piano player and a whole bunch of other stuff. This was heaps of fun, informative, relaxed, funny, but it also got serious when it needed to. Personally, I was inspired and um, I took a hell of a lot away from it. And being a drummer, that's saying something, eh? (laughs) So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Pete, Chris, Dan, Mark, Ben and Matt for the Gig Life Podcast, Guitar Speak Podcast, Guitarist Roundtable, Part 1. Cheers. I'll do that again. I think we're rolling. Now, welcome to the Gig Life Podcast slash Guitar Speak Podcast, Guitarist Roundtable. Um, hang on a sec. We all good, Pete? Yes. <laughs> it's a square stool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, on the podcast, I've done we've done a drummers roundtable and a bass players roundtable, and I've, I've felt fairly comfortable in those environments. Um, so today we're doing a guitar guitar podcast, and um, I'm not much of a guitarist if at all. So I asked my friend Matt from the Guitar Speak podcast if he could help me out with a guitar podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Matt's here today. We'll start. We'll start with Matt. Matt's got the Guitar Speak podcast. Matt's been doing it for a number of years now, and um, over 120 episodes to date. Yeah. Yep. So, if you haven't heard that, you have now. Thanks, um, Mark. Yeah. Go and subscribe to that. Some really great stuff on that. So, have you um, done all these guys? Only on my left. Oh, I'm going to work through the right. Oh. So, being an audio <laughs> podcast on Matt's left. <laughs> <on Matt's, laughs> so, um. Okay, I'll start to my left. Um, we've got Mark Maloof. Hey, Hello. Mark. Hey, Mark. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, next to Mark, I've got Ben Rogers. G'day. Um, next to Matt is Pete Northcote. Good how, morning. How are you, sir? Very good, thank you. And then next to me on my other side is Chris Camzellas. Hello. How are you, gents? Um, good. Thanks for being here today. And all the way in Newey, <laughs> via the FaceTime... Technology is Mr. Daniel March. How are you, sir? G'day. How Very well, man. Good, How good. are you doing? Not too bad. Um, wish you were here with us. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, no, it's all good. All right, so what I might do now is uh, we'll go back around the room and um, if you guys can just tell us a little bit about yourselves and, and what your sort of current gig is now and what you're up to and go from there. Mr. Mark Maloof, sir. Hello, everybody. Um, well, this time of the year is corporate season, so my current gig's whatever's paying the best. Um, yeah, I'm a guitarist from Sydney. Um, most of my time now is a mix between production work, session work, and then live gigs, um, a lot of covers, and a few original shows for artists here and there, but mostly covers for me. Ben? G'day. Um, that's all I say. Um, yeah, I'm Ben Rogers. I'm a guitarist by way of bass. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, I just... Uh, Mostly been playing with Jimmy Barnes the last few years and doing odds and ends, production, writing, um, and odd stuff like that. This time of year, I look after the children because the tour is over. Yeah, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> That's pretty much what I'm up to now. Yeah. Just dad. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Matt? Yeah. So, um, yeah, Guitar Speak podcast that's been running for four years sort of early next year. I think so. It's been good fun. Um, my day job's a high school music teacher and I'm a weekend warrior. So I'll be at a local pub playing. Um, actually, it's funny to meet Ben. I'm, uh, my busiest gig right now is a Chisel Barnes show. <laughs> so I'm like the... <laughs> hey, I'm man, the, what are you doing next week? Because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am the Fender Squire to you or <laughs> Fender Strat, man. Um, but yeah, cover, covers, functions, weddings, parties. Awesome. Podcasts. Pete? Um, so, uh, Matt, I was just going to say, you've got a really good podcast voice. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Just when you started to speak, I recognised that sound. Hang on, just, yeah. just on that, um, Matt and I spoke to each other a few weeks back on the phone and we were both like talking to each other going, man, it sounds like we're talking to each other's podcast. Because <laughs> then Matt's voice is going, Matt, and then I'm talking back to him and he goes, you sound just like your podcast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Pete. <laughs> That's great. Uh, mine, so, yeah, look, I, I'm um, 
I play in a couple of bands that I put together. I do a couple of shows that I put on and um, I still do bits of sessions and um, I base my life around a 3.30 nap. <laughs> now that is at my age, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing that I'm, you know, I'm still loving everything that I do, but it's mostly, um, uh, I do a couple of corporate things, but not so much, mostly little gigs around town and, and studio work. Awesome. Chris? Um, I don't really, I don't really belong to any gig. That's how it feels. Yeah. Um, so it's just chopping and changing like all of us, I guess. It, uh, it just changes all the time. Um, if you're not gigging, you're writing, you're recording, you know, uh, maybe teaching, you know. So it's all, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty cool. Dan? Yeah, man, I'm somewhat the same. I mean, Mark already said it's corporate season, so I'm trying to stuff up on the cover gigs as well, which I've been, funnily enough, doing a lot of acoustic work, um, which which is good for a change. But my main thing is, uh, I guess primarily I'm a singer-songwriter and um, I just got into playing guitar for people because it started paying the bills. And it was kind of easy. I do a bit of teaching as well and um, some session work on the side, but mainly songwriting and I guess the cover gigs to, to fund that. But yeah, so I'm just in cover gig world for the summer season. Cool. But okay. yeah, that's me. Awesome, man. Um, okay, well, the first topic we've got, um, it's not really a topic. I guess it is a topic. Um, what are you currently listening to? What's in the car now? Um What's on the... Who's first? <laughs> I'll go first. I'm holding a mic. I'll do it. Let's get it out of the way. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what am I currently listening to is actually um, uh, this young girl called Madison Cunningham. Um, yeah. Who's incredible. Yeah, incredible singer, songwriter, but her guitar playing is really interesting. She actually, I think she recorded the album with... Uh, Incredible drummer that we all know, A. Brown's, Victor Brown's son. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it was a – I think I maybe stumbled upon her from seeing it on his Instagram. And, um, yeah, incredible. And then the other thing I've been vibing on lately is um, uh, uh, Blake Mills as well, who's an incredible guitar player and also incredible producer, did the Alabama Shakes and some John Legend stuff, which is a bit weird. But um, – but yeah, those two things are probably the things I've been nerding on that are new mm-hmm. in my car. Anyway. Um, I always go back to blues. I listen to really old blues. So I've been um, really digging Johnny Winter at the moment and, and just going right back through the archives of, of blues and just trying to find where, <coughs> where my heart and soul fits with that genre because I'm, I'm always drawn to it and I've never quite reached that point where I feel I belong mm. and where I found where the sort of the, mm. the seed and the roots have stemmed from. Mm. So that's that's literally all I listen to. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. Dan? Um, the most recent thing I've been listening to was Alex Gibson, who's a singer-songwriter based in Sydney or based in London now. But yeah. um, you're, you're, pl- I'm, you're playing with I'm him, learning so. his material. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, we've got a gig so. coming up. This <laughs> <time>. <laughs> This but, podcast um, was brought to you by <laughs> Consummate <laughs> Professional. <laughs> Other than that, I've, guitar-wise, I've been listening to this dude, Charlie Burrell, who's from Oakland, California, and he's kind of like a, I don't know, you cross between like a Shaggy Otis meets kind of, I don't know, a bit more um, soulful, bluesy slash psychedelic. Been listening to a bit of Tame Impala recently too. Um, and this London guy, Jody Abacus, who's kind of like a, I guess, a reincarnation, well, in my opinion, of, of nerd, like early 2000 nerd when Pharrell was doing his rock band thing. So that's kind of what I've been listening to um, in the last 24 hours anyway, and my own stuff that I'm trying to create. <laughs> yeah, cool. But that's it. Awesome. Yeah, bro. Matt? Um. Yeah, it's stuff for gigs or podcasts. Um, 
um, name drop. I spoke to John Five last week, and so I had to listen to his new record <laughs> just before it was uh, released. So that was fun. Um, it's crazy country. Was that for a podcast? Yeah. Great. Yeah, man. Mm, awesome. Yeah. Coming soon. Anyway, um, but for fun, I, I popped on some old Brett Garson the other day, which is, oh, yeah. man, yeah. so good. Haven't heard it in a long time. That was cool. <laughs> Pete? Um, well, well, I don't know hardly any of the people you just mentioned or you guys. I, <laughs> I struggle with new music. I, I, it's when maybe it's because I'm older and I, I've listened to so much of it that I, I you know, I, I sometimes try and put on the the Spotify top fifty, and it's really hard for me to listen to. I just kind of go, oh, just the general top top fifty. Top yeah, 50. yeah, right. I mean, I've I've either heard it. Um, or I've heard it watered down on that. Or, you know, I, it's it, maybe it's I'm not not uh, searching out enough stuff. I always go back to um, the classics or the, 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 my favourite players and what they're doing now. Like, there's really only mm. one album that I've found in the last couple of years that I've listened to and to death, and that's Michael Landau's um, uh, what's it called, Rock Bottom, and that just excites me. It's just mm. beautiful to listen to, beautiful to jam to. Um, apart from that, I listen to a lot of podcasts too, and um, and I listen to a lot of my stuff. I'm uh, kind of, <coughs> I kind of hear different things now from you know from years and years of having to learn other people's music and having to go into a studio and learn a song or place. It's I'm I'm trying to find me, do you know. Mm. So it's rare that I listen to much new stuff. In the car, I listen to podcasts or I listen to audio books, or I listen to Smooth FM. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> awesome. I had to really fight not to sing the hook, you know. Like my daughter always sings it in the car. Like, <laughs> so do my kids. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> the Smooth they, FM. They don't, they, don't like, yeah, yeah. they don't like the new Can version. we just insert that in? <laughs> yeah. Post, post. in post. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, Chris. Okay. Um, like Pete, I listen to a lot of the old stuff I grew up on. I keep going back to it and it just blows me away even more every time. Like from the police to Van Halen, I just can't get over Like the deeper I get into it, the more it freaks me out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> blows me away. Um, but in the way of uh, newer stuff, um, Ian Thornley, has anyone heard of Ian Thornley? No. Uh, Big Rick. No. Big Wreck, oh, the yeah, band Big yeah. Wreck. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> this guy really appeals to me because he's an incredible singer, he's a great songwriter and he's even better guitar player. And um, I think, yeah, that inspires me. Um, there's one other guy that if I'm having a hard time getting started in the day, warming up the hands, I'll... Pull up YouTube and look up Doug Rappaport. Yeah. Has anyone heard of him? Yes. Yeah, I have, but remind me. Oh, my God. He plays for <laughs> Edgar uh, Winter. Oh, I love Edgar Winter. Edgar Winter's White Trash. Oh, man. One of the greatest albums. The one with... Oh. you got to hear it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I know the name rings a bell. Like a, yeah, is he like a, in the original Edgar Winter band? No, no, no. Recent? He's recent. Because it was like, like Rick Derringer in the old days and stuff. Wasn't no, it? Yeah. yeah. He's the guy now. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that band just is incredible. Yeah. Anyway. But um, yeah, that's that's what I'm getting into. Sick. Yeah. Hmm. What about you, Stevie? Um, yeah. What from, guitar are you listening to? Actually, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I can say your name properly though. So, Larry Basilio, is that oh. is that how you say it? Yeah, that? yeah, I think so. She's just released an album with Vinnie Colliuta playing drums. Um, oh, yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Nathan, yeah. Nathan, Nathan Brazilian East. Brazilian girl. Brazilian. Yeah, yeah. Brazilian. Yeah, Brazilian. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah. Nathan East playing bass. Um, oh, keyboard player. Um, play for Michael Jackson. Oh, Greg Filling Games. Filling Games. Thank yeah. you. Filling games. Yeah, it's those guys playing with cool. Larry, and um, I got hip to that because someone posted it on <coughs> Vinnie Colliuta playing drums, you know. And then I ended up getting the album, and just I'm just hooked on that guitar sound. Hey, eh? it's really cool. Mm, Check it out. Beautiful. Mm. Um, so I guess this kind of leads on to the next topic of who other players or the musicians that are inspiring you at the moment. Um, Chris, you've kind of answered that. Yeah. So if we go back around and who are the players, not not just who you're listening to to 
learn a song or something, but the players that really inspire you. You don't have to be listening to them now, but. Um. Oh, well, o- always, I think, I think every like couple of weeks someone will talk about Jimi Hendrix mm. and then I'll put on like <laughs> Band of Gypsies and then, you know, like that album, like what is it, is it uh, <clears throat> uh, Power of Love? With where the wire guitar comes in, like it's just the he- like still like or, or like another album like is Humble Pie Live with like Peter Frampton and and the the tone of the guitar like I listen to some albums doesn't matter how many times or what's been happening and you put it on and you just go oh man like they they were kicking everyone's ass in like 1973 or whenever you know like that they're two albums that I constantly would just put on. And no matter how good I'm feeling or, like, if I've heard something incredible, like, not to diss on anyone now, but I think mm. everyone would have the same thing where you put it on and you go, we're all still trying to climb that mountain. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> ah, it's it's great and depressing at the same time. Yeah, yeah. But they're, they're probably two, two records that for guitar that I'll just always have that. And then for me also, Steve Ray Vaughan, like, just mm. that was probably the first as a kid – I was like, I had a friend of mine give me a VHS of Live at the El Macumbo. Yeah. And 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 I just That's was like, oh, I can't wait to quit school and be a guitar player. <laughs> and like, you know, like, and, and pretty much that was my, I saw that VHS and I was like, I can't wait to find an excuse to leave school and be a guitar player in a blues band and move to Texas. So they're probably the three things that <clears> currently <throat> are really rock, still rock my world when I just put them on and go, whoo. As a guitar player, anyway. That's cool, man. Mark. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. <laughs> yeah, the the other um, players that really have influenced me, and I still revere them very highly at the moment. Michael Landau, the same. I think he's just a genius of touch and tone and nuance and subtlety. And for me, I, I think I approach guitar from a tone perspective first, and technique mm. is something that I've maybe not done my homework on too much. So it's it's yeah. For me, it's just all about tone and the Steve Ray Vaughan and, and the freedom of Hendrix is just a beautiful thing. Um, but I'm, I'm really inspired by James Taylor as well because I'm a, a songwriter as well and I, I find his acoustic and vocal parts just to be so seamless and effortless. And then the other person that really has always inspired me is Ray Charles, just mm. his, his organ playing. Mm. I, I love it. And just his phrasing and where his pocket sits, for me, that's, that's what's inspired me mm. for a long time. Just going back to Landau, mm. um, I th- think I told you this when we talked for your podcast, but I went and saw the Steve Gadd band play mm. at the basement and I would have spent 80% of the night watching Landau, not Steve Gadd. Yeah, hardly doing anything. <laughs> well, he didn't yeah. need didn't, Yeah, hardly doing anything. But he had this, the, they, they had him in stereo. Yeah. It just blew my mind, yeah, eh? Yeah. And I, I've got a whole lot of videos. I think I sent you the videos, didn't I, Mark? Yeah, you did. And most of them are Landau. Oh, oh, Gad. Oh, <laughs> Jimmy Johnson. Oh. Oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. He's just yeah, a he magician was... of subtlety. Yeah, and just... everything he plays, it's a different song without it. Right. Like, it's, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. And it, it always feels live. I, even on yeah. the albums, like everything just feels slightly improvised but so importantly done. Like you just have no idea how that's, you know, been recreated over and over again. Like yeah. has he done the same take over and over? Yeah. Mm. That, that that confuses me every time. That's, yeah. it's, that, that to me is like he's completely connected. Yeah. He's completely yeah. connected to who he is, what music is, and the instrument. Yeah. And it's there's you know, we I mean I don't for myself I struggle. It's a it's a kind of an instrument to me. It is every day it's a struggle. Mm. And uh, you know, there are people like uh, Tommy Emmanuel who can pick up the guitar at eight o'clock in the morning and play like a you know, like Tommy Emmanuel, but I I feel the same with with Landau is that he's completely connected mm. to to whatever it is that we're doing. And then he's got the um, the punk thing and the blues. Yeah, yeah. Well, his like with Raging Honkies. Attitude, and, his yeah. favorite band is the Screaming Meanies, and I've checked them out, and they're great. Yeah. But they're not technical, or, yeah. or you know, they're a punk band. You know, I'm on the mic, so I might as well yeah, keep yeah. going. <laughs> please. Yeah, please. Well, I grew up uh, listening to, I mean, it, it, the first two albums I got were um, uh, David Bowie, Aladdin Sane, and um, Jimi Hendrix, uh, are you exp- what, no, what was it? Band of Gypsies. And so before that, my brother was listening to things like Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, 
and Yes. And I used to listen to Yes and go, well, that's really weird shit, really strange stuff. And then I started to get into it. And here's uh, Steve Howe is still one of my favourite guitar players and, and absolutely uh, the most versatile musician I've ever heard as a guitar player. And the, you know, the rotten thing is that I met him a couple of years ago and he was a, not a nice person, you know. I was <laughs> going to try to. Yeah, yeah he was just, it was just, it was like he was not, uh, you know, how you, you shouldn't meet your heroes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's, I, I kind of go back, like I put on Are You Experienced the other day and it just, you know, I always listen to everything. But um, I really like the Steve Howes and all those older guys too. I really, I guess it's because I grew up with all that stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Dan? Well, as, I mean, Jimi Hendrix is the be all and end all for me. Like, whether it's, yeah, as, who is it, Ben or Mark saying about that freedom that he had? But it's also, I find his delicate side, which I guess people, you know, may say was kind of the R&B soulful, Isley Brothers, Curtis Mayfield thing. But like, I love Access Folders, love um, that whole album, the delicate side of that with his playing. But as, as far as the pinnacle, I'm just reading your notes, Cornerstone album, that when I first heard Eric Clapton MTV Unplugged, I was like eight years old or whatever when that came out, maybe maybe nine. And I remember that just blew my mind, like um, hearing that type of playing on acoustic. And Eric Clapton is possibly my favorite guitar player ever still. I just find he's got a, a way of, articulating it that made me feel like I could understand where he was going before I even knew how to play guitar. So, um, yeah, I'd say MTV Unplugged for that reason. And as far as acoustic players as well, there's a dude named Tuck Andrus, uh, him and his wife, Tuck and Patty, they're in a duo. But I I play a lot of his music because he was kind of like a finger stylist where he didn't play with a pick, which is... I guess how I how I play um, both acoustic and electric, but mainly acoustic. So I, I guess the whole percussive and trying to do the the bass thing, like and you know, borderline Charlie Hunter. Well, Tuck was Charlie Hunter's hero, pretty much. So um, yeah, I think uh, any of his stuff. But and then obviously that live at the Elmer Cambo was the first Stevie Ray um, album I heard. And I, I used to jam along to that when I first got my strap. So that will always be like a, a, a pinnacle album for me where it kind of fuels you with energy and also schools you again and makes you, you know, but feel did, like but you did don't you, get did it. Did you throw the guitar on the ground and, and like, like Stevie in that video? <laughs> Only uh, on Tuesdays. Yeah, I just made my friends. I, I went the whole hog. I was at jazz festivals. <laughs> Throwing my strat on the ground and feel like, man, that guy's crazy. Yes, and I was like, man. yeah, whoa. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you should see this shit on Watermelon Man. Woo! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was all in. But I, but I, I, I also got a, not so much a Cornerstone album, but I'd also say if I want to get a good ass kicking again or go to school, I, I whack on like Steve Lucas there as well. Um yeah, I can't get past his his soloing in particular, and he's, he's just so tasty. Um, if I want to get in a tone, I just listen to Mark Maloof and his Instagram because <laughs> yeah. he's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. man, Clapton, Hendrix, nice, Matt. Um, yeah, all those guys, all those guys. I keep coming back to them. Um, when I was when I was about fourteen, I was starting to make a little bit of progress. So I was playing lots of ACDC because I had an older brother with a, with a cool record collection. And that's not just from the guitar solos, but just when I realised, oh, there's a guitar in the right ear and there's a guitar in the left ear and they're doing different things. And once I sort of knew that and started working that out, um, yeah, music got very exciting for me. So just hearing the They're, the they're like the unsung guitar. Like Malcolm Young is probably one of the most. Yeah, man. I think him. I was thinking about this the other day. Nile Rogers is probably mm. one of the mm. most killer rhythm guitar players yeah. of all time. Yeah. All time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, and yeah. that's the thing, the, the rhythm, dude, like, 
you forget. And, and he's been he's been sampled more than anybody too. Eh? That, oh, that, just, as a writer yeah. as well as a guitar player, yeah. it's like and the, he he's got this jazz thing and but it's so funky and like but then Malcolm Young, it's funky. It's really funky. There's like, a pocket the early eh? ACD. Yeah. Oh man, like. And, th- and that's the production side as well, like yep. the way that they went, hey, like you do this, Angus does this, and then we'll pan the marshals like this. And then like that was that changed the world. And uh, then Phil Rudd puts down that groove. Uh, yeah. Holy yeah. shit. That's what I mean. And it's just yeah. like, <clears throat> yeah, yeah they're, they're those albums yeah. if you like, if you need to get ready for a fight, you just put on an early ACDC album. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like if you want blood comes on, it's like watch out, this guy's going to start a fight in a pub somewhere. <laughs> I just did a I just did a um uh, ACDC tribute. I had to learn five songs for this benefit concert. It was for Malcolm Young, dementia and all that. And 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 listening to the left and rights and doing all that because Back in Black was my favorite album when I was a kid. You know, it's amazing. And that came out what eighty four or something. Nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. There you go. So I was twenty years old. <laughs> so it was it was really 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 cool thing. But listening to the left and right and hearing, you know, Angus was a fucking great rhythm player oh, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, man. Just, again, another one of those guys with a natural feel and knew who, who he was and where he was. Really cool. And getting that sound, getting that tone oh, of, of a Marshall, so not real dirty, just dirty yeah. enough. Yeah, you know? it was like perfect. Yeah. Mm. With, the, with that question on the Cornerstone album, um, I think what I mean by that is... So you may have been playing for as many years as you had been, but there was an album that you just heard that made you go basically in the direction that you're going now. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm. as, a, as a guitar player. As a guitar as a player. Corn, uh, as that, a guitar, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would say for me, um, if I think about my playing and the way I like to hear things, when Ian Moss's Matchbook album came out, mm. That to me is perfect guitar playing, mm-hmm. you know, tone, melody, feel, nuances, everything. The guy's ridiculous. Like he's vibrato, yep. you know, and he sings. And I, that <laughs> yeah, that's right. to me. Yeah, it's yeah. like, damn, you know? and then he sings yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, he sings. <laughs> and, uh, I think that would be my one, you know. Obviously, like if we go back, it's Richie Blackmore and, yeah. you know, uh, all that stuff. But, yeah, Mossy's probably the, the guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mine was um, mine was uh, Relayer, Yes Relayer, and it was the hardest album for me to get into. I, like I, I was getting into Yes. I was listening to Fragile and Close to the Edge, and then Relayer came out, and it was I, I bought it and hated it. Thought it was shit, and and because I, I was making no money in those days, I and that was probably late seventies, like something like. So I was still a teenager, and I'd go into Ashwoods in the city and sell it and buy something else, and then I started getting more into Yes, and then I went. Maybe I'll try this again. I'll buy it again secondhand, a couple of dollars. I sold it. I took it in three times and changed it three times. And then I got it and ended up wearing the first one out, having to get another one and another one. And now I still kind of listen to it today. It still blows my mind. And maybe not just because of the guitar playing or the guitar playing, but the guitar playing is outstanding. It, the arrangement and the fact that those guys did it live – is is what what blew me out, and you know Steve Howe was playing one seven fives back then, and that's what made me want to buy a one seven five, and and Telecasters and things and into Fender amps, and I even though it wasn't a great tone, I just thought, what an amazing musician to be able to play all those different sorts from finger picking Chet Atkins to um, Scotty Moore, you know um, Elvis style to to really heavy stuff and really fast and really tasteful. And I think that was the Cornerstone album for me, Relayer. And you listen to it and you go, what a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really get into it, it's beyond. It's well beyond. It's one, you're one of those things when you listen to something a lot, yeah. you yeah. pick up well, on it. Mm. It might not. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. It triggers something. In yeah. You. That's the thing. And yeah. if it does that, then I it's... think that's my Desert Island album. Yeah. I, and, and though I've never learned any, and I find hip stuff really impossible to learn. Mm. I think that if I had a Desert Island album, that would be it, and I'd spend the rest of my life learning what he did. <laughs> um, my one's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit off the path that I've been speaking of, but it was Surfing with the Alien by mm. Joe Satriani. Yeah, right. Well. That, that's the first time I was like, How? that's not a guitar, what's going on? And that was the first <laughs> time my brain kind of went, mm. when you heard Midnight, you're like, 
I have to learn that. Like there's no question. Mm. So that was the one that really, mm. really inspired guitar playing for me. Mm. Now as a, as a drummer. Um, yeah, thanks, Steve. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <next. laughs> I walked straight well, into that, that was one. Deep. <laughs> that was that was really deep. No, no. Thanks, man. I oh, did that bleep out. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, I think what really turned me on to the kind of sounds that possibly a guitar could make was Steve Vai, Passion and Warfare. Oh yeah. Yeah. When that came when that came out for me, I I bought it because my mate was trying to learn the stuff. He said, you got to listen to this. That thing just blew my mind. Unbelievable. I'd never heard anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that a horse? No. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Is that a real baby? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. I I actually was thinking, I'm trying to think of what a corn, like the thing that triggered me, and I don't think I ever owned it because I was probably real small, but it was probably listening to Mossy and Diesel Mm. and just what I'd hear in Australia and, like, these people that you grew up listening to, mm. which I always find real weird because I, I know them now, so it's, like, sure. kind of odd. You know, um, hey, man, I loved you when I was five. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, no, but, like, like I think those two, like, they're so poles apart in the way they play guitar, mm. but they both come from such deep places that as a kid listening to the radio, if you like guitar and you hear that, you go, yeah. Guitar is cool, you know, like, and I think both of them for me before I bought records because I think the first CD I ever got was uh, Couldn't Stand the Weather and Texas Flood. It was like a double CD of Steve Ray Vaughan. Um, uh, but those were the things, I, those two guys were the guys I heard on the radio that when I was first starting to play guitar that I was like, I want to be like that, you know, and sing like one of them, either one, it doesn't matter, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, so, you know, we've all got dreams. <laughs> Matt, did you have a cornerstone? Um, well, I think that the ACDC was a big deal growing up. Um, but all, all these all these records are killer. Stevie Ray, uh, I think In Step was the first Stevie Ray album I got, which was his last studio mm. album. It had tightrope on it. Yeah. It? yeah, 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 killer record. And then I like, yeah, worked backwards mm. that way. Um, and that's the house is rocking and stuffs on that record, right? Is yeah, that right, yeah, yep, yep. Riviera Paradise, yeah, all that stuff. Killer. I mean, any, any any of these records. Yeah. I've heard people say that if you want to get into Stevie Ray, you should learn that album. Like that's 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 the one. I reckon it's the one where he got. He didn't get away, but he had more than just twelve bar blues on there. Yeah. So there's, there's you some, really started to hear like there was like a. It's like that thing of like you go imagine what Hendrix would have done. Yeah. It's the same with that record. You start to hear where he starts to stretch, and you go, yeah, oh, yeah. 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 But there's straight ahead stuff too. So yeah, I reckon. Yeah. I reckon that's a good yeah, that was good cool. call. Learn that record. Hmm. Let's get into the technical stuff now. So what? Uh oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What sort of strings do you use? <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Mark and I are just going to drink some of this wine out the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what specific area of playing the guitar has been the most challenging? And we're not talking about getting gigs, but more sort of. Concepts and solos and stuff like that. We we asked the same question at the bass players round table. It's just interesting to see what guitarist guitarist take is it. I reckon we may have the same answer, but I think it's finding your own. Sound. Mark is pointing to me, Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I think having the guitar in your hand and somehow even being influenced by a million other players and tones and sounds and licks and phrasing finding who you are and what this person wants to say through that that's somewhat uniquely yours, that's been the hardest thing for me. Mm. Yeah. So you so in saying that, are you um oh, how do I word this? Without being rude. No, not being <laughs> <laughs> So in saying that, would you? Would you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Who am I? I? (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. But do you come away from a session or a gig going, "Oh man, I haven't found myself." Now I, I, I've got to a point where I care much less what other people think, and I've I've come much closer to knowing who I am and what I like doing and and what I think. Is from me. Okay, good. Whether it's the right part for someone, that's right. for them to decide. Yep. But that's mm-hmm. where I'm at, I'm at now. 
Yeah. Cool. I think I can elaborate on that too because you, you looked at me and I went, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I feel the same thing and, and I think that there's uh, – I think conscious, or consciously or subconsciously many years ago I decided to stop learning other people's music like note for note and it's rare that I do that. I've, I've done that anyway but um, I, I'm, I feel like I'm still, you know, like we all are, I'm still trying to find who I am musically and that's been the greatest challenge. You know, you, you record albums and, and you listen back to them and, and there's parts of it you think that's really good. You know, I think, wow, that was really good back then. There's no way I could do it again. But it was a snapshot in time. And I think that um, finding those elements and making them me is is what I'm trying to find. And it's a struggle, man. Like as I say to you, it's like it's, it's a struggle. I, I, without going off the track, I think it's it's important to say that, you know, my parents weren't musical. And so I see people that have musical parents and I go, Fuck, you're lucky. Mm. You know, there's such yeah. a there's an in, inbred thing in that 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 yeah. that's a, a, a natural thing. And I never had that. Like we had five LPs, and they were Tchaikovsky, um, <coughs> uh, Carmen Miranda, um, a Dixieland album, and um, uh, uh, Carousel and uh, Sound of Music. So that was all I had. Even though they were amazing albums, and I still like you were talking about influences. One of my main things to do these days is find Rogers and Hammerstein pieces and make arrangements out of them for one guitar because oh, cool. they're pungent, you know, with harmony and stuff. And so, but yeah, trying to find me, I don't, you know, get the sound and all that because the sound has been the biggest problem for me too, trying to get that tone. And once you've got that sorted, you can kind of go, all right, that's sorted. And then you can move on. But then that changes yeah. and then you go, oh, oh, fuck, now I've got to find it again. <laughs> it's it's true. That's the eternal the eternal thing is, because you start and you you listen to these albums that we've all talked about, and you you listen to Tone and Steve Howard or Stevie or Jimi Hendrix or Malcolm Menangus or Mossy, and you'll naturally try and go there because you're attracted to it at whatever time. But then there comes a point where you know you can play, and then it, that's when the pressure really comes on to you as a as a musician where you become either, you know, you're just a guy who plays guitar or you're like an artist in that, that sense. You're trying to find the art in what you do with that instrument. And so I I still struggle heaps with that on guitar because I love the, I love like hearing a guy just blow like Stevie Ray or those guys when they're just like playing. I'm like, oh, yeah, wow, yeah. It just makes my like, you know, boyhood blood go, woo. <laughs> but then, like, at the same time, I'm so torn because as a guitarist, one of my favourite albums to listen to is Daniel Lanois, Belladonna. And that album is just, like, him going through as many delay pedals as he can, just kind of, like, making this ambience and there's, like, four notes in the whole song, but it just, like, takes you. And and Blake Mills is doing that sort of stuff. And you know these guys, they can play. If you said, hey, man, just hit me with a 12 bar, you go, oh, nice. But they don't. And so... For me, as I get older, I, I really, and I do more production work and less guitar playing, you know, as it were. I try and go, it's that thing of like, what do you actually want to say, you know, as a musician? So it's working out, go, well, do, is, do I need to say this with like a killer run with five note groupings that then ends on a minor third? Or do I need to say this with, like four delay pedals on and one flat seven note that just wobbles a little bit and then swells and just stops suddenly, you know, and, and that's the infinite, that's the killer thing about music is that you can say one thing infinite ways and, and, the, and, and the true artists are those people where, like we're talking about Landau, where you just, he'll play something and you go, I believe him. Yeah. Take, I'm going with you. Mm. Yep, I'll jump off this boat, mm. you know, and that's like that's a true <laughs> artist is the guy that can, without words, just with notes and guitar and like you hear his finger, the vibrato, and you go, oh, my God, and you feel like your hair stands on end. Like it's, that's it's, the dream. We all want to play that one note that makes everybody in the room go. <gasps> and then It's you go, interesting what you say like because and I think that we all, I don't know whether it's it's an age thing or, or a boy thing that when you're boys you kind of want to play guitar, but as you get older you start to get into production because it's yeah. more than just the guitar. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I, th totally I think we're right. all kind of gone yep. through that. Daniel, totally. what do you reckon? 
I agree with you 100%. That's, that's kind of, um, I guess, reading Steve's question, if I had to pick something that would be challenging for me, just to iron it out, then I'll go back to what I was going to say. When, when she was saying maybe like soloing speed, like I'm, I'm not one to go and chop out over jazz changes or solo over giant steps or any of that stuff. So I, I might find that challenging if I had to. But the thing is, my approach as a guitarist, because I, I, I'm re- a relatively new guitarist. I didn't pick up guitar till I was like 16. I don't know if that's new or old, but I was. I was writing. Depends how old you are, Dan. <laughs> oh, thirty-two. <laughs> but um, I was, I was. What? No, I mean, like, you know, if it was young started, <laughs> never started. Who knows? People could have said when they say. But I think when it comes to guitar playing, to me, I've always just used it as an as an instrument for a greater purpose, which was the song, or yeah, what Pete's saying is, I guess, uh, production. So. I've always been, I guess, into parts more than, um, like, even if I go to a gig now, like, I've always been more impressed by parts than someone playing a a, a Steve Vai face-melting solo. Like, I remember when I saw Larry Carlton and Robin Ford, I went home going, man, that Robin Ford's rhythm playing is ridiculous. And that's what was the highlight of the show for me. It wasn't Larry Carlton solos or anything, which isn't to knock it because I went to the show. Obviously, I love it, but the the little the little things like you know is is what I've always found interesting about guitar. Like even just a, a telly plugged straight in the desk sounds great to me, like all the fun records. But I, I think as far as the challenging things to me as a player, I, there's no way I'd stand up and do a jazz gig because I just suck. <laughs> but um, me too. And I, and Plus I, one. And I, and I Plus one. And I couldn't. I, there's no way I could shred. Like there's no way I would stand next to. You know, like um, I, I do like a bit of metal, and I do like fast playing, shredding playing. But I, I can't do that stuff. I would find that challenging. But, so, um, so what's what's the biggest challenge in in finding the right stuff for the parts for you? Well, I would say. Um, I probably can come up with too many ideas that it gets cluttery. Like I can okay. always just keep layering. I don't know if people are the same like with the guitar thing, but I can go, oh, that's another guitar part. That's another guitar where it takes away from the other part. Like, and when you listen to like, you know, um, I guess music that may not be, even if you listen to Hendrix or whatever, or um. I'll, I'll say Clapton because I was just saying it's my favorite. When I hear a song like, uh, what's Clapton on? Sting, It's Probably Me. When they did that song, I just find the space in Clapton's playing so taste, so tasteful and so taste. And the parts are perfect to me. But if I was probably in that session pretending to be Clapton, I probably would have layered like five other guitar parts on top because sometimes it can just get like that. And then it's just taking them out, I guess, that part is the hardest about finding the part, if that makes sense. It does, totally. Yeah, I, I keep layering stuff because I don't like hearing myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe if I cover up that one and then you cover up the next one and you cover yeah, up the yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> could, could I ask along those lines of finding your voice, how, how do you guys do that? How, what's, what does that really mean like for a lot of the gigs you guys were talking about is playing other people's music mm. um so when we were talking about lando before we go yeah he plays for gad he plays for taylor but he's got his punk band on the side like do you guys have other music you make where you can express more of yourself you know, is you that know an what? active thing you chase after i i didn't get to add to what we've been talking about <laughs> and it goes down your thing okay. that yeah, you're saying. Cool. but um the hardest thing has been like I don't I've I've never like really I've been hopeless at learning shit like as in note for note solos and I have no patience for it. Like I bought the Surfing with the Alien book, I bought Ingve's Rising Force book, I bought Passion and Warfare, I looked at opened it, started and went, screw this. Well exactly the same. And I went no. What are the chord changes? Uh okay, what scales are you using? Uh 
you know. So the hardest thing getting further into my guitar playing has been, is everyone going to accept what my, this is what I want to do, mm. you know. Are they going to accept that? So that's what gets me sort of nervous, you know. Uh-huh. But I definitely don't want to copy someone and, I, mm. you know, like when we play those guitar gigs together, Pete, um, I'm at a stage now where I'm not thinking about, oh, I want this to be like Luca or, you, you know what I mean? Like we just play and whatever, you know. It's, it's, it's going to come out. you you got to let go of all that shit and, and just be yourself, you know. Of course there's going to be stuff there that's come from years of playing and listening, you know. But, yeah, for me it, it's that are they going to, I'm going to put myself into this. Like even with Richard Clapton's gig, you know, it was like he was perfect because if you listen over the years, he's always used the player. He's never, he never came, I, I know Pete did this gig and it came through you. That's how I got the gig, right? But um, he never told you how to play because all the players that went through, they've left a mark. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's all the same songs. His set's been the same for the last. Yeah. It was good freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And the same same with Jimmy's gig. Yeah. Same same with Jimmy's right? where where same thing where you step into the shoes of like some of the most incredible guitar players this country's ever seen. And so bits of those players will end up and and you'll get to the gig and it's your turn and you know, you're not the guy that was there before. So inevitably at the beginning he's hard on you because he's like, no, 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 no. Old mate did this. And you're like, that's not on the record. I didn't say it was on the record. That's what's here. And you're like, shit, okay. And you do and 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 because there's 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 little bits of everybody sprinkled through the gig. And then you you play long enough and then you find your hole and you make your little marks in the gig. And it's funny for me because like for a long time I'm his son-in-law, I'm young in the band, so I was like, they're going, oh, he just wants me to play like Mossy, like I can't play like Mossy. <laughs> like, well, more than Diesel's, oh, my God, you know. And so, like, you agonise over this stuff. But then, like, I've not done gigs and that someone's called me and said, oh, man, he was hassling me because he wanted me to do that bit that you do on this song. And I was like, oh, it's it's happened, you know. It's like, oh, it's only taken, like, eight years. But, you know, but it's it's true. Like, and and just by playing, you you'll naturally, as you – stumble into your important part into that band and add that. And then when you're gone, you're you're always there in the gig too. And that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing about playing, what you're talking about. Well, you know, I'm sorry to butt in. You know what, I, I, I don't do like... Um, you got two mics then. Far yeah, out. I, don't, I don't. Hit me up. Uh, I'll go out of the room. Um, the, you know, I don't do the, like the touring band things anymore. It's just too hard for me and, and there are younger, more handsomer guys doing it. But I, what I'd love to do is, and this is why I still love playing covers and I've done it all my life, is that I use a song as a skeleton. Mm-hmm. And it's just got bones, right? And I can do whatever the fuck I like. It's you know, there's some things you got to kind of play the solo, but I forget them. Mm. You know, you'll learn. I can't remember how many times I've learned some of the pop cover songs solos, note for note, thinking I've got to just do it, and then it goes if you don't play it all the time. So I kind of let go of that and just do. And and I mean rhythmically, quarterly, everything. I just improvise all night, and that's that's what you were asking about developing your own sound. That's how I'm finding it. And that's the best thing. Like I came down to Rambling Rascals about, what was it, a month ago? And it was cool because I haven't seen you play like stood out front in ages, yeah. you know, and th- that was what was exciting about the gig, not the fact that you're playing all the solos from the record. It's I'm, I'm watching Pete play, yeah, you know, and it's raw yeah. and it's mm, yeah. and you're pushing it and you, you know but it's, it's interesting cuz there were a lot of guys a lot of guys that who was i speaking to uh somebody i can't remember it was somebody of great importance musically internationally and he said you know like you've got to play that solo note for note I went, oh, shit, I don't do that, <laughs> you know. So some people think that you have to and things, but I, I, and really all it boils down to is to, for me to find myself, I need to improvise and I'm not a jazz player yeah. and mm. improvising for me is, uh, you know, in a song in E, 
you know, and there's so many things I can do over that equal, and that's what I love. Yep. Mm. Matt, what about your playing? What's been the biggest challenge for you? Ooh, good question. Biggest challenge for it can me. be it can be a te- even a teaching question as well. Yeah, I think um, I think when I, when I started doing some recording in the in the nineties and. I, I, was, I didn't do heaps of sessions, but I did, I did a bunch of stuff and it was the best and it was the hardest stuff. I remember one record I did, um, David Moyes produced it. He, he was in Air Supply, um, great guitar player, but really w- was really hard on me and the other guitar player, but it was the best, the best learning experience ever. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It was funny though. I went to the bathroom and um, – I thought, am I ever going to finish this song? And it was a Steely Dan book. He had like a little library. And it was Steely Dan. And, and I, you know, you've heard all the horror stories about Steely Dan. And I goes, oh, man, I'm in Steely Dan. I'm one of the guitar players that's not going to get on the record in three weeks. It's going to yeah, be yeah. six other guys having a shot. So that was – so just being accurate and clean and, yeah. and getting the job done, that was that was a good lesson. I don't know if it's the hardest thing. It was, mm. it was a great lesson though. Yeah. You really learn how to play in the studio, don't you? Because you're just yeah. ears yeah. in. Yeah. And then you hear, you hear you yourself do. later on. Every so. time shows up. <laughs> yeah. Now, how do you develop your playing at this stage of your career? Well, Mark eats his uh, delicious sourdough <laughs> that he's brought for us all to eat because that's what us guitarists do. It's really, really good yeah. too, Mark. Yeah. It's Thanks, one of the Mark. best I've ever had. Yeah. So when this guitar came, it just he's starting a bakery. Um uh, what was the question? I, I just want to comment. I just want to comment on the. I was looking at the bread. The, I got the, bre- the bread, the bread, the specially cooked loaf of bread <laughs> today. I'm missing out. The wine, the venue, and I just compare it to the the drummers' <laughs> <laughs> round, t- round table and the bass players' round table. You can see why I don't play bass anymore. <laughs> 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 I mean. <laughs> Life's better up here, everybody. What, what, what's, what's different? That actually hurts because it was at my house. And you've really <laughs> <laughs> Stevie, what's Look, different? Just pour him a big ca- wine. The catering. Yeah. Really? That's all? The, yeah, the catering and the and the, uh, the ambiance. Ambience. Yeah. We, because, I mean, with you know, I always think that the, <laughs> the drum community and the bass playing community is solid and it's really, really a yeah. community. I don't think there is a guitar community because we only – yeah, right. It's really rare that we get together. The, oh, one of the best things that we ever do is the um, Hendrix Nights. Oh, yeah. Because there's 10 guitar players on it. Mm. And we all just, it's the hangout, the back yeah. is the yeah, best right, thing. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, that question how do you develop your playing? How do you develop your playing? Um, I, I feel as I go on with everything I do in music, it's just learning when to shut up. Much with the amount that I've spoken on this podcast. It's just my... <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, it's seriously though, like, um, yeah, I, I just want to be able to say what I want to say with the least amount. Like get to the point. I think in life, you know, I've been trying... So how, you, how do you work towards it? Shut up and listen. <laughs> it's, but you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, that, it's that simple. Like, oh, this, like, you, like we were saying before, the song speaks to you. Mm. And if you mm. re- are really listening, the song will speak. And there's, there is always a time for like lots of notes or, but it, it might not be in the way that you think, you know, like, it, it, you know, and that's thing, you just have to listen. And the more you listen, not like we were all saying, like you don't, go note for note on things because that's not the whole point. You're listening to the music and the music goes in. Mm-hmm. And if, if you listen really intently, then you 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 pick up on the, the vibe. And so then when you play, it, it it's like it goes in, gets all muddled up with your whole life experience and everything you've done and what you had for breakfast and comes out on your gig in its own way. And so, yeah, that's that's as a guitarist, a bass player, producer, a husband, a dad, Mm. Is just to listen and and like let less you know just be more pure with what is coming out in the moment. Mm. I think that's the that's the absolutely amazing thing about music, isn't it? Yeah, is that that it's it's almost like 
the taste of a soup, of all the things of your life in a <laughs> yeah. soup, and then the taste is what comes out. It, it, 100%. Like your sourdough, Mark. <laughs> yeah. It's it's <laughs> all those ingredients is what makes it work. And I think family, children, you know, whatever mm. it is, yeah. life experience, and all those things come out as a player and and can develop as the years go by. 100%. And that's the most amazing thing about music, I think. Well, and it? that's that's art. That's, that's what art. I mean. We're all artists, you know. Yeah. Whether you, what, no matter what instrument you play, you're an artist, yeah. and and that's the beauty. Like, you see, you have a big night, you see an incredible sunrise, and then you go home and you write a song, and it's just some beautiful song, and you're like, well, I just got really hammered and saw this beautiful sunrise, but it just the <laughs> the world spoke to you, and yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. happened. Yeah, like yeah. it's. And we, you hear That's those cool. stories growing up as a kid when they go, yeah, we all went to France and it was beautiful and we stayed in a like chalet and we made this album. You're like, wankers. But then if you go to France and stay in a <laughs> yeah. chalet and eat like baguettes and delicious bread like we're doing now, you go, I get it. I totally yeah, right. get it. I would make that record too, you know. like yeah, right. That's me, life. Mm. That's the, the best learning thing for music. Yeah. I've got a bit of a different angle. I feel silly coming after that because that was such a lovely answer. Well, I can drink wine now. I've done yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> but um, how how I'm developing? What was the question exactly? Um, how do you develop your playing at this stage? In your yeah. Career? To tell you the truth, just hearing that and and having an answer before I heard it, I, I think I go from a little bit of a self centered approach, and I think it's um, it's one of not really. Well, learning to not care about what the outcome is as far as just being confident in yourself and just going, hey, this is what I am. Because I come from a songwriting background. Like, mm. I'm the same with Dan. Like I started playing when I was 16 but I was writing before then. Yep. And I think for me the development part is just going, you know what, you do have good ideas. If people don't like it, that's cool. Do you like it? Yep. Well, then back yourself. Mm. And that that for me is the development process for me, just to back myself with the musician and just everything that that is sort of what comes to my mind when I play. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah, that's my answer. Matt, I'll ask you before we go to Dan. Sure. Um, I know for me that there's seasons where you're just learning songs for a gig or you're just – me, I'm preparing a lesson, so I'm learning a song for to teach a lesson or <laughs> – or whatever. So, and that's all great. That's so good. I mean, learning chisel stuff, you know, getting inside Mossy's head a little bit um, has been amazing. But um, but if you can pull aside from that, the the deadline sort of stuff you have to learn and just just noodle, just be creative, just be give yourself space and time for that, mm. which is harder to do when you've got different commitments and mm-hmm. things. But um, just put off the critical hat for a while and create, and then the little things that you like and that you can pare that down and mm. squeeze that into your next gig somewhere or your next solo, just a little mm. idea and that might be a kernel of something that keeps growing. Yeah, cool. So that's fun some to of, do. Some of my best um, creativity is after my 3.30 nap, <laughs> um, which kind of ends up being 4 o'clock, 4.30, then me and their hot seat is on 5 o'clock <laughs> and the uh, – the changes are great because it, it, it's mostly in D minor, but they do go up the D sharp minor. <laughs> and then occasionally you'll hear it in B flat, but it's like the, it's literally this. It's, oh shit! <laughs> they are the, the, the D doesn't have a minor or, or a major third, so you can fuck around with it with wherever you like. So I can spend hours doing <laughs> me and our hot seat. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That is that's straight after that, that. That is that is the best practice thing to do. TV, I swear. I <laughs> when when I when I was a bass player um, at university, uh, we would I would sit and just put the TV on and just do that, and you jam like in whatever the movie is, you just jam along, mm, right. and you're like butchering through changes, and you're like. And you're just like, oh, what's happening in the movie? But yeah. you just jam a lot and it's so much fun. It's great yeah. having a girlfriend that understands that. It's <laughs> really cool. Yeah. She'll look over me and go, oh, that was cool. Uh, <laughs> like a man. Dan? Man, I think Benny and Pete both just nailed exactly what I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. But um, I think all I could add to that in how I kind of develop my uh, playing is – I guess the ratio of, like, if, if I have to learn a bunch of songs that I don't 
particularly uh, listen to if it wasn't work related. I have to outweigh that with, you know, the fun stuff. And and what I mean by that is like when I was a teenager, like all of us, we probably would easily happily play eight hours till your fingertips bled and whatever. I I, I don't have the kind of uh, privilege to be doing that now, but I I find the same weight. Um, of, of influence like whether I'm listening to um, players or whatever or if I get the odd chance to uh, pick up a guitar for 20 minutes um, which is more rarer these days um, I find that it inspires me just as much you know what I mean so like if whether I'm listening to an interview with Paul McCartney or listening to Blackbird for the 2000th time to me I'm still kind of is developing me either way because there's just so many different facets and I guess that's what was it Pete who was saying that like it's, it's everything that you know like the sunrise whatever that's what comes out into playing like Stevie Ray's playing wasn't because he well I don't know the guy but I doubt that he was you know like going lick over lick for 13 hours a day I'm sure it had stuff to do with other things maybe alcohol as well that resulted in that playing but I'm learning all that stuff kind of, um, you know, it's all like I put on a big melting pot or soup, <laughs> cooking it up, and then it come, comes out naturally. Like I don't have to practice scale so much if if I'm listening to music, it's feeding me in the same pot, you know what I mean, that same music headspace. So um, I just make sure that, you know, I out, outweigh work with um Feeding my musical uh, soul, <laughs> if mm. that makes sense. Mm, totally. But yeah. Um, how do you guys manage your your down periods when work's not not there? It's quietened up, or how do you deal with three thirty nap? <laughs> <laughs> Million dollar hot seat. <laughs> I think I've, you know, I've always, you know, I'm, I'm a busy guy. The last, this last year I've kind of, it's been the year of no thanks. So I don't, I don't take on so much. You know, I was putting on too many shows last year and it just kind of fried me. And, and uh, the, so the, the down times that I've always, what I've filled it is, with is doing my own stuff or doing a production album or, yeah, that's what I've done. I mean, I had a recording studio for, 15 years and I would just go there and just do something, write something. Yep. And, and it was really fruitful for me because uh, in in many ways, I mean, as far as business is concerned, I still make money from royalties from mm. live music mm. as well as all, mm. all the library albums that I've done mm. and that's been amazing for me. That's bought me a house and it's bought me, you know, everything. So, so you, you kind of, without trying to be productive, you just go, well, I've, nothing's on, let's do this. And I'll just get in the studio yeah. and create. And I've always had a recording yep. studio, so so it is, it's got to be a, a cool space. You've got to enjoy being there. I've, you know, when I had the studio out at St. Peter's, it was a hassle to get to. It like, was, okay. and so that took up too much time and I'd kind of shy against going in there and doing some work. But I think that you, you've got to kind of try and find some creativity in you and, and write and record because all that stuff is great superannuation. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's really, really good that, that you know, with, with 12 hours, there was a year, couple of years where I, I just didn't need to work at all. I was making a lot of money by just doing library albums or royalties from library albums that I'd done years before. So those things are really, really handy and they're fun to do. Yeah. You know? yeah. Chris, you didn't answer that developing, how do you develop your, I'll cut this and hang on a second. Chris, how do you develop your <laughs> <laughs> Chris, how do you develop your playing at this stage in your career? That sounds such Maybe a Maybe he didn't want to hey, answer. That sounded like, yeah, that, that sounded like yeah, a yeah, hey. He's like, man, like, why is this drummer asking me this question? Um, <laughs> okay, everyone's talking really deep and shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just say oh, um. Just oh. Um. I'll tell you something. Yeah. Developing uh, my picking. Yeah. Right, technique. Technique, yeah. That's so, the first technique answer we've had. Yeah. So 
I had it right when I started. Okay. Right, and then the, these all these videos coming out, um, REH videos, Paul Gilbert, and you know, Hot all mess. these. You got to pick down and then up and down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. I'm like, holy shit, I'm doing down, down, up, down, like da- sorry, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up. And so I thought I was doing the wrong thing. And then I'm trying to do the alternate picking. Shit, this is hard. This is hard for years, you know, mm. and it's more recent that I've worked out, you know what, Eric Johnson does economy picking. Ingve Malmsteen does economy picking. Like they all do this economy picking and that's what I was doing day one, <laughs> you know. Cheated. You yeah, so them. now I'm you like sue them. I'm going back to the start, <laughs> right? Yeah, but I reckon, I reckon yeah. you start one way but you need to – yeah, I reckon if you start one way and you don't try and get the down up thing together, you're limiting yourself. So what you did was a really important thing to do. I, I, I agree because there's a part of it that goes with rhythm. Yes. Right. So it's like you got to have that sixteenth type thing going on in your head and and that movement. Yeah. But when you're playing like soloing and getting through scales quickly, you know. Yeah. I think um, you naturally fall back yeah. to that way anyway. Yeah. But if you have never done it. You're limited. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're wonky. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I think it's but, like stretch it every way you mm. can. But I'm going back to the um, <laughs> yeah. economy. Back picking. to the yeah. beginning. Yeah. yeah. Mm. That's my thing. Anyway. My, my last yeah. technical thing was uh, me and Franco. When when Mahaley first started working with Joe Bonamassa and stuff, um, <laughs> me and Franco just felt terrible about ourselves because we were just like, damn, we really got to practice. <laughs> and, um, and we were talking about Josh Smith and stuff and uh, and I was probably mocking Franco. I love him. He's one of my best mates and one of the best guitarists I've ever played with. Um, uh, but we were doing Hippopotamus for ages, the five-note groupings of uh, like phrasing, like so you do five-note groupings in your solo. And so, like, every time he'd call me for, like, oh, a year, I'd probably like, go, he'd answer, go, hey, man, hippopotamus, 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 hippopotamus. But, you know, I said it enough times now that when I solo, I totally do those five-note grouping things that Josh Smith and those dudes do. So that's probably the last actual technical. You know what? That That's funny. Being raised in a Greek family and there's, like, Greek music is, like, yeah, odd Yeah, incredible, times. yeah. I just can't help but do odd number of notes every time, you know. That's cool. I can't, that's I, cool, I, yeah. Like, that's the... It's like far out. This is a cool lick. What is it? One, two, three, four, five, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Eleven notes. Holy shit, you know. And <laughs> make it awesome. make come back on the one, you know. Yeah. Eleven, you know. Yeah. That's, anyway, but that stuff's killer. It's funny that you said that. But it's so killer. <laughs> like you hear that playing across time yeah. and it just – it. It's like, and with the picking, like mm. like Joe and Eric John, like they're so, mm. every note is like, well, oh, yeah, he's damn. Yeah. yeah. And so when you've got those groupings, it's just crystal clear across the bar lines and then they hit the one and you're like, whoa, they made it. Yeah. It's like when you're watching a movie and like, <laughs> is, the, is the good guy going to win? It's the good guy. Gonna, yes, he won. And it's all, I feel like it, that. It, you, know, you know, those times where you guys missed the one? Yeah. Who's there? What do you mean? Who's what do you there? mean? You mean just No, no, no. See what I mean? You, you thought, you just thought after we the drummer. missed the one, but we were just doing five-note groupings. Yeah. Uh, do you mean just <laughs> after the drummer stretches the time so he can fit his fill in? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. boom tish. <laughs> one, two, You're not going to win any four, arguments five, here. Five, six, yeah. seven. <laughs> yeah. There's your yeah, prog. Yeah, seven. That's it. That's there how you do it, kids. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Um, Chris, how do you manage your – down periods, the downtime when I'll probably start writing. Yep. And uh Do you go practice and get together with other like a mate of mine who's uh a good engineer producer and we just write and write. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Come up with stuff. Even do stuff like what Peter was saying, come up with music for library music and mm. yeah. Mm. So you guys at stages now where if the work does sort of quieten up quieten up, you can you're not too worried? No, nah, always, always uh, got the hustle going. No, I'm not a hustler, okay. and okay, and that's always a battle. Like you, don't, you know, you think like, oh shit, that's it, I'm done. That's, okay, that's my time. Right. But 
I don't know. Peter's better at. We've <laughs> had this older. talk here and there. <laughs> but, um, I, I don't. I don't think many guitarists are actually hustlers. Yeah. To be to be fair. No, I don't think so either. Yeah, it's, like 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 Franco's the same. You know, like, Franco's totally just not not. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm just gonna surf today. Yeah. He um, comes over my place. That's yeah, what I do. <laughs> I hang out with Franco. <laughs> He's the linchpin of us all. Yeah. <laughs> and we uh, set up amps and we play them really fucking loud. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, you see, I'm 59 now, so it's, it's, it's you know, it's... it's. Do you it, get a Les Paul at 59? Yes. At the end of 59. <laughs> it's like a gold, gold Les Paul. Gold, yeah, it's like a gold watch for guitar players. No, it's it's interesting because, I mean, <laughs> my, you know, I've, I've been through some major changes in, in the last 10 years where, you know, my mum was a paraplegic for seven years and it was wow. it was crazy. Oh, shit, man. But um, that, was, that was an amazing time. And so the focus went from music to... Being a parent, do you know what I mean? I don't have kids either, so the, she was my child. But um, uh, the down times, uh, I can't remember where I was going with this, but I think um, I can't remember where I was going. So we can come, so we'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. The hustle? The hustle, no. It was going to be so fucking important, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> It was gonna be just one of the best we'll, we'll things. We'll fix it in post. Oh no, you're talking about you're talking about you know you know you don't need to work and etc. I think that you know um, I, I don't really want. I say no to a lot of things now because I just don't want to work hard. Do you know what I mean? However, I want to play. I really want to play, and so it's in and and as a result, it's never really been about the money to me. I just if it's going to be fun to do, I'll do it, mm-hmm. and that's why I've put on my little gigs and I've got a residency on Thursday nights at the Rambling Rascal and a, once a month down at Beaches. And I love putting on those shows except when people pull out on you and then you kind of go, well, hang on, I was doing this for fun and now it's not fun. It's always the drummers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, you know, like you, you, those, you like if, if you set yourself up, and I think it's really important to talk about this because a lot of people don't. A lot of people are waiting for the phone to ring. And the phone ain't gonna ring. And music's not that important anymore. We don't we don't have as many things as it used to be. So so it is important to like Mark's got the studio running, you know, and you've got stuff to do in the studio, and you you're creating stuff that. I mean, the beauty about doing library stuff is it's money while you sleep. Yep. You know, and it still brings me in a lot of money. So. I, it's ne- never been a worry for me. Money is like, oh no, I have to go and work, or I have to go and do the boat shed. For two hundred dollars, because mm. I need the money. Hey, I do the boat. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Chris has got it. Chris has got it. I love the boat shed. Yeah. See? Yeah. Because <laughs> they, you know what? I can play anything I want there. Yeah. They're all yeah. so drunk they love it. <laughs> <laughs> Set up the marshal, and you're going to cop this. That's you, could even pl- yeah. you could even play groupings of four. Man, could, hey, yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, just quickly, yeah. I just, just want to touch on that. I, I think Pete's bang on. I think a lot of um, musicians in general are maybe a little bit lax. And I think to prepare and, and do your business properly means there's only downtime if you choose to have it. Yep. And I think that that's something that I've always had in, in my sort of way of doing business. If there's downtime, it's because I've said no I want the downtime, mm. you know, and mm-hmm. I think that's really important for musicians to actually treat this like a business mm. because we are lucky. Like we get a lot of perks being musicians. We get a lot of daytimes free mm. and we play in the night times to people that usually really want to rock out and party with you and, mm. you know, we have a lot of privileges. Mm. But if you, you know, if you take that for granted, a lot can go wrong because this is the type of industry where nothing is set in stone and as Chris said before, we really aren't in a band as such. We yep. just hide guns, you yep. know, for particular people every now and then along the journey of what we do. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Who who teaches here? Apart from Matt, I know Matt does. Do you guys teach? No. no? I have at the moment one student. Yeah. And a that's week. a regular thing? Weekly. Yeah, he just comes over and yeah. Is that Franco? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's me. Uh, you know what? Yeah, I, I, gotcha, I, I just um I years ago <laughs> I, I taught know, and uh, <laughs> I just decided to stop. Mm, yeah. I just couldn't hack it. Yeah, it fried me. Yeah. Yeah. I love you, Franco. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Dan? Yeah. Dan, what do you do in downtimes? Well, have you got a family, man? Do you have your family? No, 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 I don't. I don't have a family at all. I got, I got a little niece that I, I've been looking after more and more. But um, ironically, I decided 
to try and get some teaching next year um, just because it was a regular thing just for the Newcastle Con here. It was just like a day a week. It wasn't so much tutoring. It was just I get to be involved with the creative hub. I mean, I haven't got the job yet. Hopefully I do because it would, it would mean I can say no to some gigs. But We'll send them the podcast. It, it. It. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's crazy because I, I, guess, I guess downtime, like if it is a bit quiet, there is – I'm always creating and like doing stuff in my own um, – little home studio I guess well the, the current home studio but um but yeah like um I don't I like to think I can hustle every now and then but I'm not really out there begging for gigs either like I, uh, like going damn I missed the you know the boat shed on a on a Tuesday night or whatever I'm, I'm short I you just kind of I guess the nature of our job and business we it, it kind of since it's so up and down, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I probably don't get as much royalties from stuff I've done as, as, as Pete has with the libraries, but some of the co-writing stuff, I, um, I'm, I get a nice check in the mail every now and then. And what I'm saying is it, it's so up and down that you kind of learn to, uh, navigate it. And, um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm always busy doing music, but I haven't really, <laughs> I haven't really thought of getting a a regular routine um, where I know how much I'm I'm making or know how how much I'm gigging, like to the T until until now at uh, in my early thirties, where hopefully you know this job pulls off, which is only a twelve month contract, but um, and and that that again is just in order to do other things in life like get property and stuff like that um, but but yeah is that it's it it's about time you got a day job mate that's what, <laughs> that's what <laughs> I, get a haircut I've never had one in my life. this music thing is never going to work yeah. it, it's <laughs> it, it's that thing I think with, with being a musician you have to actually be a little crazy because yeah, totally. when you think about it like like you you're saying you're you're Parents weren't musical. My dad was a musician. My dad started a music shop but then had me and got to this point and him and my mum went, oh, we need to put a roof over our children's head and like, they, you know, this music stuff, it's not a sure thing. So my dad joined the Air Force and became a wow. career Air Force officer. He still plays music. He still plays to this day. He's a great guitar player, great singer. But, um, yeah, they just – and my dad loved it. But was worried, and my mum just really didn't understand. Like even even to the point where, you know, I married Mahalia. We we were working. I was making good money. We bought a house. You know, we've got kids, and she's like, oh, "Well, you know, what are you going to do when this music thing doesn't work, Benjamin?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Mum, like you know, I'm like nearly thirty, and I got a house. Come on, like I didn't dream yeah, of this. Well. Like I'm living some kind of crazy dream mm. that I imagined when I was." Eight holding my tennis racket in front of the mirror, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Um, uh, and and I think that's that the thing for for all musicians is you have to be a little mad because you just never Ooh. know. Like that thing, you fall and you break your hand. For all of us as guitarists, you're like, Fuck. oh shit, yeah. mm. and and oh, that's, man, that's, I get a split in my finger and I freak out. And and that's what I mean. <laughs> like there, there's a, there's a the, you kind of like you're living on the edge, no matter how set up you make yourself. So you're always a bit crazy doing it in the first place, mm. which is, I think, like musicians, we have all, as we've talked about before, there's a lot of crazy people in the music industry. Um, but it's about that the art sustains you. It's that thing, like we were saying, like, you know, you don't know if you're going to get some bread this week, but you just got enough, but you're kind of like, oh, and you're like, oh, man, I'm starving. Like I, we, we spoke about it when yeah. I did the podcast where yeah. there was periods where, I just a point where I had I was, I'd been doing big gigs and then I had nothing mm. by choice and also by external factors and whatever, but I just couldn't. And in my whole life, it's maybe because I'm mad or crazy, like I was talking about. But I just it's what I have to do. Mm. So you just push through, and that sheer force of will makes it happen. You know, like you just like I I, I got to play. I got to. I keep saying I'm unemployable. You know, <laughs> yeah. Really, so I have to keep doing this. Yeah, it's, yeah but right. it gets to this point where you're like, you're like, man, like, you know what? This That's is good. it. I'm, 
you know, and it's and it's funny because like you talk to people who aren't from this world that we're all in talking about it today. Uh, so um yeah, so how much superannuation have you got? And you're like, oh, I've, I've got a '60s L series Strat, and uh, <laughs> you know, like that's that's what musicians say when you ask them what they've got yeah, for yeah. super. You know, like that's you know, like what, what what do you mean? What's 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 that? Is that like a should I should I get that for my superannuation? You're like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know, yeah, buy it from Jackson's and you'll sell it three <laughs> times on you. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Yeah, yeah. Where is Jackson's from Jackson's Red Guitars? Um. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You're like my, my parents went out because I left home when I was 15. I was out. I, they didn't get where I was going. I didn't know where I was going, but I, I left really early. And it wasn't until I was playing, was I think it was with Richard Clapton. I was on a wage and it was a good wage in those days. We're talking mid-80s. mid. And one day my, my, my old man said, how much money are you making? It was more than he was making as a wage. Mm. And he said, have you got your guitar in the car? And I said, yeah. And he said, go get it. I went, oh, well, this is like a freaking audition. <laughs> so I had to play him something and he kind of went, well, I didn't, never really realised, you know. I never <laughs> realised. Well, and and what that, that was really interesting because he just did not understand what was going on. And what's even funnier is there's a part of me where, my, where I'm uh, – confident to do anything and there's a part of me that's not at all and I know that that's mm. part of my parents where where my mum would go, mum would show us something, she'd go, she'd go, that's great, darling, keep practising, keep at it and then there's my other, my other ear hearing my father go, turn that bloody noise down. Well, that, that's the downtime. I reckon for us musicians mm. is that inner battle that like it doesn't matter that's how funny. old you get, that's always in there. Like I, was, I still deal with that anxiety of, you, like we're we're successful. We're all musicians. We're all great players, and we we've done killer stuff that like people would go, oh, that's cool. But I guarantee, or that you always get to this point, and you have this that that whichever parent it is, or like person yeah. in your life, <laughs> that that voice that goes, yeah, you suck, mm. yeah. you suck. Yeah. It's yeah. funny, quick, with, totally. Um, totally. The, the thing with your parents, because I've got that with my dad, right? Same. Um. He always wanted the best, you know, their parents, they want the best for you. But um, I remember early 20s living at home and walking out the door and I had a, a, an originals band with all, all the guys from this band have gone on to do things. Like it was awesome what we used to do, get together three times a week, rehearse the shit out of the band and write. And I remember walking out the door and dad saying to me, where are you going? I'm, I'm going to rehearse with the band. Oh, are they paying you to do that? I'm like, no, it's, it's our band, you know. And straight away that hit me like, <laughs> holy shit, what am I doing? Yeah. Really, I didn't, I learned later, that was developing me to be who I was, you know, yeah. for other gigs, you know. But it's funny how a parent does that and it stuck with me all along like, the mm. money thing, the money thing, you know. Mm. It's like that's always in the back of your head, yeah. you know. Yeah. But if you know where it's coming from, you can, you, you're cool with it. But, you know, it can stick with people yeah. and, and affect them, yeah. but, you know. That's, yeah, I just relate to that, you know. Who, who's got musical parents? Are you parents musical? No, no, no. What about you, Dan? No, no. Mark? Nope. I know you do. Just, just me. What, what no. about you, Stevie? I do. You do? Yeah, my what? dad. My dad. Piano player, singer. Right. Yeah. And Matt? Um, grandparents. My grandmother was a pro, well, semi-pro pianist. She gigged a lot but skipped in the middle. Yeah. I think it's really interesting, you know. I see, I see like, uh, people that have musical parents, they really have this natural ability and, and I'm envious of mm. it. Mm. It's, it's weird. I mean, I'm happy where I, who I am but I see people and it's like this, they take it for granted. It's this natural thing. And it's beautiful. But, I feel like that about my brother because, right. like, so so my dad was a muso and he gigged and stuff, like, but was like, like a weekend warrior. Kind of, that's how he would describe it. Like, he worked nine to five in the air force. He'd do gigs and we'd get posted, and he'd have to put a new band together in Darwin or wherever we got posted to next, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I worked really hard, went to ANU, studied my ass off. Was like, I have to prove myself and blah blah blah. And then my my little brother, he was like, Yeah, I'm going to play drums. And I was like, mother, he's like real good. Like you know, he, it's that thing of like, because he just saw what I was doing because I was doing it professionally. And he's just like, yeah, yeah, I play drums. 
yeah, it's just that's just what I do, you know. Like, and, and I am envious of him in that way. Yeah, like it's the same thing where I just look and go, man, you don't you don't realize how lucky you, you're yeah. awesome. Yeah, I was like sweating balls for like eight years to do that. And you're awesome. Come on, man. You know, and he's like, yeah, yeah, maybe one day I'll just you know it's not work. I was like, dude, wow. You know, you know who's like that? Kerry Buchanan. <laughs> like, don't you reckon? What do you mean? Like he's he grew up in musical natural yep. family, yeah. Oh, and yep. the guy's like he's a motherfucker. He doesn't play drums for like he has an accident. <laughs> doesn't play drums. Then we get into the studio and he's um gets behind the kit yeah from nowhere, and the feels the same. Yeah. Everything's yeah. What the yeah? He's he's got a you know? very special gift. That guy. Now let's talk about playing with different instruments on stage. So we'll start with piano because I. Um, had Bill Risby on the podcast a little while back. And my question to Bill was, how does a keyboard player play with a bass player? Because when we did the bass players round table, um, one of the topics was a bass player playing with a piano's left hand, the, the, low, the low end on a piano. So after talking to Bill about that, and I, and I mentioned we're doing the guitar podcast, he thought maybe I could ask the question, how does a guitar player play with a piano player? How do you go in? Ha- I've got ha- a gig with Bill next week, so can I can I just text you back? After? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I play less. I play a lot less. I, I stick the three note chords and and uh, skanking and all that. So I, I can leave that. I love it because most of my gigs, I've got to look after harmony. I've got to look after every area of harmony. Okay, and. Um, and I love that too. I like I love the three piece thing. I absolutely adore it. But it's another great thing to play with a keyboard player. But I play a lot less, and it's really relaxing. Like it's a, it's a joy to kind of just yeah. sit back and let somebody else look after the harmony. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. So, but how do you? Um, or maybe one of the other guys can answer this. How, how? What if you get together? You haven't played before. You've got to put a piece of music together. How does that conversation go down? The, the way I'd do it is just work out what the roles are. So mm-hmm. who's on rhythm mm-hmm. and who's on anything else? Like it, nowadays a keyboard player it's, it's, it could be defined as a synth player. Yeah. And a lot of synths are just pads in the background yeah, that just right. fill out sound. So, I mean, a guitar, you, there's no point doubling that up, mm-hmm. you know. But if at the same time if, if there's a piano player that is playing a lot of rhythmic stuff, then maybe we could be the ambience behind it and have our effects going. Like Mm -hmm. I think it's just defining what roles everyone's doing and having that conversation and working out and listening Mm. what that other player is doing and then changing to sort of match that. And I think it's really important that as a guitarist now with all the electronic music that's out there and the importance of synth things Mm. that we really do find a way to listen and find our part and be malleable Mm. because if we're rigid, it's always going to clash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's interesting um, when we're talking about finding our own voices, people were talking about, you know, ingesting lots of influences and what comes like the soup, the soup analogy, all that kind of stuff. How, how beautiful is it when you're with a group of people who are all listening to each other and you're, you've got a whole new soup going on with? Yeah. That's, that's where the fun is, I reckon. Yeah, it's oh, good. That's, you, know, you know what kills me? And I, I, this is a common thing that happens to me is I get to a sound check. And I, I hear the drummer go, can I have some more toms or more kick? And I'll go over and you haven't got any guitar or any keyboards or anything else in your film. And you know what? It's apparent from the moment you start playing they're not listening. And it, it annoys me. I don't say anything. But, you know, there are some guys that I play with and they just go, give me lots of guitar. Mm. And you know what? It's the most joyous gig are you, are, you the, are you the boss on those gigs? <laughs> no, not at all. No, not at all, but good joke. No, um, but you know what? It, it amazes me that people don't want to hear. I want to hear everything on stage. I don't yeah. want to hear just yeah. me. Well, no. I, I, think, I think we've probably both in gigs that are like, you know, obviously I play with my wife. I play bass on that gig. But the soulmates is Franco, Dave Hibbard, both the Dolies and Mahalia. And that band we've been playing for like, oh, 10 years, I think Franco's the newest member. And so that's 10 years of playing. And and so that band, it's that thing. This Every gig's like a suit for good or bad. Yeah, you know, yeah, if someone's yeah. having a bad day, everyone's having a bad day because yeah. you're a band. And yeah. so it's like, 
oh, we're sinking the ships. Like, you know, I, I, if I'm in a bad mood, you know, and I'm just like angry and just like kind of just playing stuff, people are like, oh, oh, everyone feels each other, which is so beautiful but makes for like really great gigs, mm. really worrying gigs, you know. <laughs> like, so it's like it's one of those things. It's like a family and, and it's like when I, I came and saw your gig with um Karen, and, and and that had a similar thing where everybody mm. was obviously listening to each other, and then as an audience member for me listening to that gig, watching you play guitar, oh, you were just, just you were just so like you just like totally just not touch the guitar for ages, and I'd be like, man, that's awesome. And then you'd play, and it there, just there made was lazy. It. There was lazy bones. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I was talking to to you, Mark, at the start of the gig, and, and you had no sleep. You'd had no sleep, so it was what would have been a. Classic case of. So he of, fell oh, asleep. No, and I loved it. That was the favorite gig I've ever seen him do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but they would, the band sort of pick, picked up. It was, yeah. it was awesome. What a great gig that it was. was. A, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lovely gig that one because everyone's listening. It's mm. true. But I think what Pete said, if if there's an answer to your question mm. that's for other musicians out there, I think yeah. it is that. Get the other players in the mix so you can hear. Yeah. And if, the, if you can't hear them, we'll make, find a way that you can hear them and mm. listen and really sort of find your spot. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Dan, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's pretty much all been said. But it, what Ben was saying a couple of questions ago, answers ago, was about learning to shut up. I think that's my thing with playing with other instrumentalists who I haven't before. Um, I kind of, as best as I can, you try, you try and figure out the patterns in their playing and kind of steer clear of it if you if you haven't played with them before or but without you know sounding rubbish but I find shutting up is, is the answer pretty much and then the parts come like even it could be as simple as if a keys plays in a certain register I'm not going to play that 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 inversion or that um I, I might play an octave higher and a different inversion or whatever or a little part like but I, I I guess um, you know that's that's where I mean I, I I listen to so much Prince that I think my default now is like I just kind of go hmm what 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 would what also would one of the most Prince underrated Prince rhythm players of all time a hundred percent yeah but like like he can sit on like a like a G a G chord or whatever like a little funk thing for the whole song. You know what I mean, and it's not boring because he's. I guess he's creating the entire track that it becomes like he's thinking of it as 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 music, as a song, rather than just as, as an instrument being the be all and end all. But I, I think in in terms of if you rock up at a cover gig and you haven't played with someone before, I just try and shut up and 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 suss out their playing and see where where it sits and try not to conflict with it. You know what I mean. But um, the, the the original gig, I guess it's never really happened that you're doing it on the fly. Well, not for me. I guess I've always played the original outfits that have done a few rehearsals, so you know what you're playing, um, which is ideal in that setting. But um, but yeah, I think it comes down to shutting up and trying to figure it out. Which which is a joy that guitarists have. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what I mean. Like, yeah. like when I go, if yeah, I go yeah, and yeah. fill in on a bass gig, I wish I could do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, no, what I mean? yeah. there's so many gigs where I've been playing bass, and that and that's why I love guitar because it's like, in a way, it's like a holiday from totally the the downbeat. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. Because yeah. you you go to the you rock up and you, you know, like this gig next week with Bill and Jonathan Swartz and Hamish and Darren Percival. So for me. I'm I'm super nervous because these guys are all giants in in Sydney. But then at the same time, I'm like I'm playing guitar, so and I know Bill is killer. So yeah. I could just lean over and go, Bill. I have no idea what these slash chords mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to play single note lines. I'll see you in three and a half minutes, and it'll be totally fine. Yeah. You know, like yeah, and 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 that that's part of why I love guitar because yeah. you just have this freedom of time. Yeah. To like, which you make stuff real funky, yeah. but then you can also slide between time and make stuff just feel looser. And it's like such a beautiful thing to do mm. for me coming from doing gigs where I'm playing bass and you're just like holding it down and you're like either yeah. a little bit in front or a little bit behind the drummer, you know, that's, that's a whole other thing. Yep. 
but um but on guitar it's just like for me it's just like an, an immense freedom of rhythm which i love mm. i really love it mm. Mm. chris you got anything to add to that no it's all said <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, band leaders or musical directors you've worked with want to have some stories, be it stories that have impressed you or... Yeah, I used to, like I've I've done a lot of work with Kerry Buchanan. He was an amazing Mm -hmm. um, musician and still is, but his harmonic knowledge is is beyond anyone. He's just beautiful. And he would stop me with voicings, Mm. you know, as a drummer, he would stop me and voice it this way or voice that way or just leave leave the the fifth out or leave the third out. And he wrote he wrote charts that were almost impossible to read. <laughs> but um but he was uh very specific in what he wanted. And it was it was it was great to work with somebody with, with such knowledge. Because I think that's my thing too, is understanding my harmony as well as I possibly can is to, you know hear and, and create from that point of view rather than, mm. you know, jamming or whatever it is. But, like, to understand harmony the way that he does is is really interesting. He would – he and, of course, I grew up understanding harmony from a classical point of view mm. and then went to the conservatorium and let the jazz side of things, which is the same thing, but there's – you come at different angles. Mm. And so uh, having um, worked with somebody like Kerry and his uh, – his information, his knowledge was was beautiful. Mm. There was another guy I used to work with. His name was Peter. Peter, oh Peter, he's going to kill me too. He's he was listening. Such an, he he's was listening a, too, Pete. He is. He was an amazing um, uh, band leader and conductor. And he, I met him first when I was asked to do Cats, uh, a Saturday matinee and a Saturday night, and I had the book for I don't know, a couple of days, and it was just it just made no sense to me, and I don't read well. And all that sort of shit. It was the hardest thing I ever did in my whole life. And I, I, I did the matinee and I, you know, could you, you can imagine that you've got like with cats, there's like bars of 13 8 for days and then a 3 8 bar and then a note on the second quaver, bing, and then nothing else. And he'd look at me going, where was that? As he was conducting underneath the stage. And I, it was the most hardest thing I've ever done. And it, it was great because it, it made me realize I didn't want to do that. It wasn't me. Mm. But he ended up booking me many years later to play on like Andy War um, Andy Warhol. Um uh what's his name? Warhol, not Warhol. Amazing classical singers and all those albums. And he'd get me to play on those albums because he knew that I listened better. Oh, Anthony Warhol. Oh, Warlow. Yes. Thank That's you. The one. Do I win a prize? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. Right. Andy Andy Warhol <laughs> albums. They were full of tin cans. Yeah. Now, um, so you know, there, it was interesting soup. coming from that. Like he, he kind of sat with me the, <laughs> after the after the first uh, matinee, and he said, "Mate, let's get this together because you, you're not on it." And I went, "Oh fuck, man, this is the hardest thing I've ever done." And he uh, it was he was cool because he knew that I could play. And what was really lovely is that he booked me for albums, knowing that I didn't read. And it was it was really cool. Um, Dan, shoot across to you, man. Yeah, man. I, I'm kind of kind of the same as in MDs. I, I I don't really have any freak stories. I've I've had a couple of cases where I've been playing with um, I guess bands in in whatever whatever capacity that is, whether it's covers or uh, a tribute or an original thing. Where so, some of them have been like a bit. <laughs> questionable like someone will throw a drum solo in a 6-8 waltz or something just to fill in time or a, What's wrong with or a bass solo <laughs> no, no, you, no, you know what I mean yeah, and then like the next song will be like a funk tune and they throw you know whatever um, a scat solo in it mm. so, but uh, as far as um, yeah good band leaders I, I think I think an unsung leader in Sydney um I reckon Yanya Boston is a great leader because whenever you're on a gig with him, like he, he's got he's got a, a natural ability to take control of you know a situation band wise. Like when you're just in there and you don't know really who's who. Like I think it's kind of important to outline those roles and stuff on on whatever gigs or whatever. But um, yeah, things I've worked 
with him, um, whether it's original or or covers, I think he's got a, a really good command um, and an understanding of how things work, like instrumentally as a, as a band. Like, because I think a lot of the things where they've been more negative cases with band leaders, it's where I guess they don't really. Uh, well, well, I assume they don't really have a have a, an understanding of other instruments, but theirs, where, where it's, I guess mainly been vocalists, where it's been like little things that you know have been questionable, not just to me, but to everyone else. But but yeah, I got no crazy crazy freaks. So I got actually a, a great MD, a guy I was playing with from the states. Ricky Peterson's younger brother, Paul Peterson, um, he's a multi instrumentalist, but mainly a bass player. He played guitar for Steve Miller Band as well. But um, mm. I found him to be an incredible MD, and um, just yeah, he just began the control and understanding of how instruments work as a, as a as a team. Mm. I, I thought was exceptional. But yeah, I don't really have any freak stories. Mm. Daryl Beaton's another one. Daryl yeah. Beaton's a, a, a great band leader too, and he's fun mm. because he creates as he as He's he fun, man. He's yeah. a fun dude. Darren Beetle. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I would say for me, uh, like we were saying before, Paul Gray is someone that most of us have worked with mm. who is a great MD and band leader. Um was that uh, a similar reason what Dan said? He just understood He understood the instruments, instruments yeah. yeah. He would like, you know, the the few times I worked, he'd be like, hey, man, that's really great, but it's wrong. And I'm like, oh, he got me. He got me. He's listening. <laughs> like, you know, because like, that's what I mean. Everyone, everyone, like, you know, and that's the thing, they have an ear for if something's not right. And that's what you want in an MD is the guy that's like not rude, but just goes, hey, man, I love what you're doing, yeah. but just that's not it. And, and you go, okay, 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 you got me. All right, it's fair enough. Um, the other person who was actually my my base teacher at university, Eric Ajay, um, he was a great band leader in MD as well because he was probably the first band leader that I worked with through uni and he took uh, an on, a touring ensemble for uni and we would tour all the jazz festivals of um, Australia with this uh, commercial ensemble playing like Jaco tunes and like Christopher Cross and mm. just he – Heaps of different stuff and he would make a point of like taking all these like, you know, we're all like in our teens desperately wanting to be jazz masters and he'd be like, yeah, great. And here's like, you know, sailing. And you're like, oh, what? What? This is so simple. Like, oh, you know, and, mm. and he was a great band leader because in the teaching of what he of what he was like, no, no, we're playing this chart. And you're like, oh, okay. And, and, he, and, and, you, and it was really... He was really beautiful because he'd pull you up and just be like, hey, Ben, yeah, I know you want to just drop like 16th note Jaco licks all over this, but that's, you know, it's that thing we were talking about where learning to, to shut up and the taste of it. Because he's an incredible bass player, played with like Freddie Hubbard, mm. Shaka Khan, like did wow. heaps of sessions in, in LA and stuff like that. Um, and, and one of the most beautiful people you've ever met. And he was a killing band leader for that reason. He really <laughs> got... New, was a musician's musician, so he would get to the heart of the playing. And it was like having a great MD, I think, or, or anyone who's leading a band who's really great is basically like halving the amount of time it takes for the whole band to get great because they can get to the point of what it is, you know, and just be like, hey, yeah, yeah no, nah, man, no. Oh, because they hear something that's going to go wrong before you do, and that's their job, and that's what makes a great band leader, I think, or MD. Mm -hmm. Matt, I, I was just going to ask: Have you guys done, like Pete's mentioned, MDing? Have you guys done MD gigs, and what does that bring to your playing? Stress, stress, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You forget. Does about it make playing. you? Does it make you play less? No, but I tell you what does happen is that you get on stage and you realise you've still got to look after the, all the other stuff. Mm. So, so the gigs that I do, some of the shows that I do, I start, I do everything from posters to everything. Yeah. I have nobody else involved. Yeah. So advertising, all, all that sort of stuff. So by the time I get to the gig, and I'm really into the audience, I really am friendly with all my audience. So I'm out there meeting them before I'm even on stage, and I've. I've been through a sound check and and the bass player hasn't learned the notes and all that sort of stuff and I've so all that stress comes to you but you try and go into showtime mode <coughs> and you got to do it mm. 
because that's what people are paid to see. But um, it, it can be really stressful. It's rare that you, and it do, but it does happen, but it's rare that you get to play really well because of all the other stuff you've got to do. And sometimes when, once it's, if, if it does work out that everything's organized, like I did this year, I only put on one Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd show. I've been doing them like three, four, five a year. Mm. And I only put one on this year and it was great because in many ways, because we didn't have to learn any new songs. We had a rehearsal in a studio and then we played a long sound check. So I was free and, and, and all my advertising and all my organising had been done months before. Mm. And, and what was also great was because I only put one show on, people came from every part of the city to see it. Right. So it was really successful. And that kind of alleviated a lot of the stress. Right. But it can be a nightmare. Mm. I was going to add a little bit. I've, I've, I haven't really, like I've got a, an interesting um, past with MD things because I've been MD quite a lot for artists. Um, but it's usually, I, I think I just sort of use my producer's ear and I'm just like, well, I want the songs and the performance to sound like how I'd produce them. So that kind of comes a little naturally. But all the other gigs that I've done with MDs, I can't remember any other circumstance where they haven't just said, just be you and you do you, which is I think a really rare thing and I feel really lucky that I got that opportunity with the gigs that I have done with MDs. Mm. Yeah. Different. Matt, you would have worked with some band leaders, MDs? Yeah, um, no horror stories. It's mm. always been good. Especially when I was young, I thought my job, I'm going to try and do the best job for the band leader I can. Mm. Even if it was playing parts I didn't want to play like the Ben talking about Wailing 16th, mm. like sort of hippopotamus or whatever. Um, <laughs> so I just threw myself into it in that way. It was good. And then when I did MD jobs, I was, a, I was actually a church musician. Um, well, I still am, but I was a church music director, I should say, employed for about 10 years. And um it did nothing for my guitar chops, but it did so much for working with people yeah, right. and yeah. considering how the PA is working and, um, yeah, all the big stuff, all the, like people saying, all the big picture stuff. Well, that, that's where I would, I would back what Dan, when he mentioned Yanya Boston, um, because he, it's about dealing with people and he's killer at that as an MD. Like I've worked with him. He's one of my best mates too. And, um, he really cares about the people first, I think. Yeah, yeah. And and so – and from that, the music is is usually fine because he's like, are you okay, man? Yeah, you cool? You know, having a good day? Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm hungry. You want to get some food together and eat? And and it's that thing. It's like a good MD makes you feel like you're in a band even if it's for one night. Yeah. 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 And that's that's what – that's that's the band leader or MD that you love is that guy because you feel a camaraderie and you're in, the, in this mm. gig together and you're like, yeah, we're in the trenches and we're going to – fight through these stings and then play for this wedding or you know what I mean? Like, yeah, And I think to tie it all together, it's like people, band leaders will book you because of who you are. Yeah. And so they yeah, want yeah. the right yep. people together. And that's also a good band leader. That's a good band leader. That's right. Yeah. Jamie Rigg, he was another one. Uh, yeah. Jamie Rigg was an amazing band leader. We used to do um, uh, Club Buggery, which was Roy and HG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we also did like the uh, a lot of uh, Channel 9 specials like Ray Martin specials with Tom Jones and, and all that. And, and the band was always amazing. I mean, we're talking, you know, 80s, 90s, but they were, they were always great bands and he knew how to deal, pick the right guys. And we're talking about horns and everything in those, those days. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, I hope you enjoyed part one of the Gig Life podcast, Guitar Speak podcast, Guitarist Roundtable. Some real nuggets of wisdom to take away from that for sure. Um, Part two coming very, very soon. If you dug this podcast, please share it with your friends, your family. Let more people know about these incredible musicians, but more importantly, these really good humans. My name is Stevie Taylor. This is the Gig Life Podcast, and I'll catch you soon. Cheers. All right, there you go. That was heaps of fun, and the second half of the guitar hang will be coming up in our next episode again my my warm thanks to stevie taylor from the gig life podcast thanks to mark for hosting us at his studio and all the guys who are uh, shared so freely it was uh, it was a really cool time super inspiring 
Okay, this is Matt Wakeling from the Guitar Speaker Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time. Bye now.